Good morning. This is Jonathan Drapkin. I'm the president and CEO of Hudson Valley Pattern for Progress. And this is another of our continuing discussions about how the pandemic has disrupted our lives. Today, we are focused on healthcare. And with us are Linda Muller, the president and CEO of Cornerstone Family Healthcare. Joan Cusack McGurk, President and CEO of Montefiore St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital. Hal Teitelbaum, Managing Partner and CEO of Crystal Run Healthcare. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I just have to say it. I, I, there is a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid to the healthcare community. Um, your institutions, all of your employees, all the people that have been involved in this, it is remarkable what you have done, um, what you keep doing. Um, in 9-11, the, you know, the front line were our police, our fire, and our um, EMS. And here, there's no question that uh, but for healthcare um, providers, hospitals, private sector, all helping each other, nurses, health technicians, um, this could have been much worse than it is. And so I just want to start by thanking all of you. So let me start with the first question, and I'll, I'll start with you, Joan, on this one. Um, as healthcare professionals, when did you first realize that something very different was happening? Not simply a newspaper report of, you know, maybe uh, China, but when did you realize that this was something very different? Um, when uh, Patient Zero uh, presented to our emergency department and um, followed shortly thereafter by patient number two, patient number three, and how quickly overnight we had to change the way we delivered care. So it, it, a word that comes to mind is um, onslaught. It was, it was an onslaught of patients. Um, sure, we had all our emergency management and we were prepared in that way, but we were not prepared for the volume or the acuity or the emotional turmoil, not just on um, the patient, but on the front line. So it was in mid-March that um, it started, and it started very rapidly. Thank you. Linda, when, when did you realize this was not business as usual? March 11th. It'll be a day in infamy for our health center. It is, the, it is our patient zero that we uh, eventually transferred to our colleagues at Montefiore St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital. We certainly didn't connect that the gentleman could be positive for COVID-19. He presented differently with his symptoms, um, but we were, and, and our, my staff did everything that they would normally do in an emergency setting. They nebulized him. Uh, well, that's a problem, right? Because all of the, the, the molecules and the steam and everything is in the room, um, so that changed our lives forever. We had to, for we had to send out for fourteen days quarantine that entire team of people that managed that patient, and then the doctors got nervous, and so they started saying, "I don't know whether we should bring the patients into the building." So we started to see a drop off of the total number of patients that were booked for an appointment. Um, Pre March eleventh, on average, we would do somewhere between. 12 to 1400 visits a day throughout our system of care. The week after patient zero came through the health center, 238 patients we saw, both telemedicine and face-to-face. -face. The health center just business stopped for us. And if you think about why did it stop, we listened to every one of our politicians say, stay home, flatten the curve, be safe. When you hear it enough and you're scared enough, you stay home to do that. So transitioning from that first two weeks to, to doing the kind of work that we're doing today, um, I don't think it took too long for us. I just think that gearing up for the fact that there was such a thing as COVID-19 and it was in our offices and continued to be there through some of the most 
um, some of the most difficult patients to deal with um, inner city markets, as well as those with substance and alcohol abuse services that they needed. Um, you know, it was it was trying to learn a new normal. But March 11th, we'll never forget that date. Yeah. Hal, how about you? So, um, you know, I think uh, we started thinking about this uh, very early. Um, we realized um, when the first case of human to human transmission was reported in the United States at the end of January, uh, that this was potentially uh, something you know, very serious. Uh, prior to that, you may remember everybody thought you had to eat some exotic uh, animal um, to or be exposed to an exotic animal. Um, and uh, by February, we were seriously beginning to plan uh, looking at our PPE, um, you know, thinking about how serious this could be. As a matter of fact, Joan and I were at a conference um, after one of the first cases. We were we were together at a conference after one of the first cases was um, uh, diagnosed in um, New York, and uh, I suggested that the follow up meeting to that meeting be uh, by. Um, a conference call or Zoom, uh, and you know, frankly, people looked at me like, "What? What are you talking about?" Um, but you know, I think we uh, did realize uh, Greg Spencer here at Crystal Run, our chief medical officer, who uh, was former military, uh, you know, was was in full pandemic mode, and said, "I think it's time to panic." Uh, he had actually sent out an email in January. Uh, in mid-January, telling our physicians and other providers that because of our proximity to the New York City airports, we should be prepared. Um, so uh, I think we're a bit ahead of the the, the curve. Um, but in March, um, be, before patient zero, um, we we have we actually diagnosed the first case in Orange County, not an Orange County resident. So it's not patient zero. Uh, it was an Ulster County resident. But um, we diagnosed the case, and I would say again that that was a, that was sort of the moment of truth, because then it was real. You know, then everyone understood the significance of this. And frankly, when we, you know, when we reached out to the uh, public health authorities, among the things we were told was that um, we should notify uh, the 130 or so individuals with whom that person might have had contact during the prior recent period. And I think that sort of alarmed us at several levels, uh, including the fact that one, yeah, this is here, but two, uh, maybe the system isn't quite ready for it if they're expecting the providers to do the contact tracing. Which is still an issue today, trying to figure out a whole plan for contact tracing as we return to work. Um, Absolutely. Um, and so as this started to unfold, what was your, you know, you all have relationships with the state and to some degree, the federal government was the state's response was, were they, where you thought they should be and, or did it take time for everyone to ramp up? Um, yeah, you know, my view, nobody ever said that I wasn't outspoken. In my view is that a pandemic response uh, requires, uh, at a minimum, a national response. Uh, you know, in my view, it requires a global response. And you know, with, without you know pointing fingers, um, we were way behind behind the curve. Um, you know, we you know we have nuclear deterrence. Uh, you know, we have a strong military, um, we have a border defense, but against a pandemic, we had nothing. Uh, instead of, you know, the Space Force, we might be thinking about the Earth Force, or at least the Health Force. Um, we have, yes, the invisible enemy, as the president likes to call it, but we didn't have any defense against this enemy. Um, you know, frankly, I would I would start with, you know, our healthcare system in terms of, you know, we should have 
a national database, we should have a truly interoperable medical record so that when we start seeing people getting sick in abnormal numbers in skilled nursing facilities, when we start seeing too much febrile illness in a region, we can react immediately. We know something is going on. Um, we, we also uh, need to have uh, the ability to stand up um, testing and, you know, contact tracing. Frankly, you know, we are still using 20th century techniques to do contact tracing in the 21st century. We cannot, you know, when the, the primary use of contact tracing in most of the United States, most of the time, is to identify the, the uh, intimate partners of those with san sexually transmitted disease. I mean, yes, it's used for other things as well, but on an everyday, day-to-day -day basis in every county and in, in, throughout the country, sexually transmitted infection is the, is the probably most common use of contact tracing. When you have a patient with STI, with sexually transmitted infection, that individual generally knows who their partner was. Most often, they know their name. Uh, in the case of COVID-19, we have none of that. You don't need intimate contact, and you probably won't know the name of the person you ran into in the pharmacy or the supermarket. We need a whole new level of technology-enhanced contact tracing, which actually exists in the world, but we don't have it, and apparently, you know, at least in most locations, don't plan to use it. So, and then obviously there's the issue with, you know, with PPE. Um, you know, there's, there's, there was just a failure, frankly, at every level um, throughout the system, which put us behind the eight ball. So, Jonathan, um, you know, my take would be that this pandemic is a, is a novel virus. We've never seen it before. Um, we watched it in Europe. We watched it in Asia. And hindsight is always 2020. You know, how, what could we have done better? Lessons that we have, could have learned, will learn from this. I think the biggest issue that will come out of this whenever we get out of this is what will the relationship be between the federal government, state government, local government, and then everyone else in between. And, and the issues will always be, as we watched it, states say, you can't tell us what to do. The federal government says we don't have any authority over the states. And so once we can get past all of that and get back to what the business is, the people's business, what did we learn? How will we manage this? Um, and will we ever really truly be ready? It all just depends. It depends on what the next pandemic will look like. And it will depend on whether it's a virus that we've known before. And if there's a way that you can attack it, either by vaccinations or by antivirals. Um, but it's going to take it's going to take a greater village to be able to address this. I think that we have lessons learned and, and should we choose not to learn from the mistakes that were done, that was where failure will be. Joan, take us inside the hospital. So after patient zero and everything, as it started to ramp up, you know, Hal mentioned PPEs and the, you know, were we ready? Mm -hmm. What was happening to get ready? And if you can, um, humanize us as the head of a hospital, what was happening in the hospital? Well, you know, Jonathan, I've often said out in the community, um, when people resist uh, wearing a mask or social distancing, I wish they could follow me around in my hospital. I was in there 60 days straight. And I will tell you, um, first things first, we had to create very quickly a real live surge plan. You have a surge plan. Any organization has a surge plan. But when you have to um, absolutely implement this and overnight, um, it looks a little different. When you're getting a directive from the governor, and rightfully so, we need you to double your bed capacity, your licensed bed, not even your staff bed. And, and we need to have that in three, 
three days. Um, that, that was a heavy lift. So overnight, literally overnight, we went from um, an average daily census in our intensive care unit from 14 to 30. We, we did a 200% increase. And at the height of the COVID influx, the sickest of the sick, went up, we went up to 42 and 40 patients were on ventilators. I did not have the staff to cover all. I had to open up a second intensive care unit. So we converted a med surge unit um, under our surge plan, a 32 bed surge unit to our second intensive care unit. And Jonathan, there are no words. First of all, the competency, that level of competency, competency by our physicians, I have um, a finite number of intensivists. So now we went to a teller intensivist at night. Um, our colleagues at Crystal Run um, assisted greatly. They brought in two intensivists. Um, our critical care nurses, I went from a staff at 35, I needed 90. So I had, I had to um, move nurses from other areas that were not, we were not doing elective surgeries any longer. So the surgical staff became intensive care nurses under the mentorship in the direction of the ICU trained and educated nurses. So it was, it was an enormous lift. At the same time, we're trying to obtain PPE. Um, and there was, as both my colleagues have said, an incredible amount of lessons learned, but a lot of good things. I saw um, the synergy of an organization come together with the synergy of my colleagues in the community. We were all one. There was no, there was no uh, territorial um, aspect of it. We were trying to level set between the Montefiore Health System. And what that meant is if my colleagues, to the, as, as you know, the South got hit, downstate got hit a lot quicker than we did upstate. So we took their patients. They gave us equipment when we needed. So we were able to level set um, within several organizations. And, th and when I tell you, and patterns included in this, there was not one business or community organization in this Hudson Valley that has not come forward to really assist Montefiore St. Luke's. Um, they were really outstanding. And on both campuses, there are trays of food, uh, emails, countless emails every day. But it was really preparing for the surge and trying to operationalize the surge in some type of um, orderly manner in the midst of chaos. Uh, and we got there. We got there. And I'm, um, I, I, I'm happy to say today, you know, the COVID admissions are no longer 8 out of 10. They're now at 2 out of 10. So, so things have come around. But it, it was a heavy lift. And I do not believe... There was any preparing for this. No one, no one could have prepared in the sense of the the numbers, the acuity. There were these people who came in and presented. I mean, I think the community can um, sometimes get caught up in that most of our patients got discharged, seventy five percent. But that twenty five percent were the sickest of the sick, and I've been in healthcare my whole life, forty three years. I have never seen anything like this, and I've never seen a community come together like this, but it was, it, it was amazing. Thanks, Joan. Linda, um, it, it always occurred to me during the course of this that things like the opioid crisis, mental health issues, the basic things that underlie so many health care, they didn't go away. Did you find that you had to reach out to clients and people that you'd always been working with to try to figure out some way to help them get through this period, you know, the last 60, 70 days? Well, for, for our uh, substance use disorder program, um, you know, we're still admitting new patients. The, the biggest issue that we had was their fear for coming in and my staff's fear for seeing them because these are highly risky patients. Um, so once we could get past how do we how do we put people in a queue 
essentially to come in and get their methadone dose? Or what do we do? How do you safely see your counselor or see your physician? Once we got past that and figured that all out, it was somewhat business as usual, but the anxiety levels rose greatly. So someone who who's even on methadone, when the mental health issues start to override the good practices, it's really easy to flip back into old behaviors. And so we ramped up and we have the, the, the boom in our business has been around mental health and supportive services through, through our psychiatrist or child psychiatrist and our licensed social workers. So we've been able through telemedicine to connect all, all kinds of patients, right? Patients um, are coming in who might have lost a loved one or, right. and now what do you do? Or, or our child psychiatrist is dealing with, with parents who are saying, you know, their daily routine is not the same. They're acting out or they're sullen or they're quiet or whatever those issues are, which is really kind of normal behavior for a child. So when do you move from this is something that needs to be treated versus, you know what, it's okay. We've really done a, a ramp up of those things too. But when stress happens, um, you see a spike in suicides. You see a spike in deaths as a result of uh, illicit drug use. People who might have been clean and sober go back to an old habit and the, the dosage that they were taking before they were getting healthy they die, plain and simple, they die. I have two friends who, uh, one committed suicide, their their niece, and the other was a, a nephew who overdosed. Really good family people. It's the Sorry, stress man. of being able to, to try and manage the difficulties, especially people who might be isolated. So, um, and you know that, that, that a lot of this is, comes from, from communities where there's great disparities. Um, and how do you how do you connect and manage those and ensure that they have access to the same quality care that they have always had? Um, I, I want to get back to the the equality as this virus hit. It became clear that we were dealing with um, access to health care mattered a lot on how much money you had. Uh, wealthier people had a different way to deal with this. But how you know I've always been amazed with, with some of your forward thinking in terms of how you pivot. Um, in the middle of this, uh, you know, it became clear that you redesigned the waiting room. And there were, you know, I, I, the whole notion of the waiting room became your car. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the ways that you redesigned the delivery of healthcare on the fly? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, very early on, um, you know, we, we did start to plan and think about uh, what we can do uh, to maintain access to care, to keep access safe. Uh, obviously, we stopped doing truly elective procedures. Um, we we you know, stopped uh, truly elective in-person visits. Um, you know, again, what, what is elective in healthcare? You know, things that are elective today um, are not elective tomorrow. You know, how long do you wait a mammogram, um, you know, go? How long do you defer it before you think it's no longer, um, you know, something that's truly elective because more people are going to develop, um, have cancer uh, that will progress because we didn't do the appropriate screening. So, you know, same thing with vaccination, some of the concerns now about vaccination as Linda was referring to. So, you know, what's elective one day is not elective if it goes on for too long. And, you know, access is certainly, um, you know, the sort of the first step in quality is access. Uh, so, you know, things we did very early on, we wanted to create, you know, safety in our offices. So um, we created these uh, stand up, uh, this, we, we stood up rather these um, uh, outdoor, uh, COVID designated COVID evaluation centers. So for anyone who had fever, respiratory symptoms, um, any almost anything that we thought could represent COVID, they were asked not to come to our uh, indoor office sites, but rather go to one of our outdoor sites where a provider actually, where again, where they, the individual came in their car, they waited in their car, 
Um, they called us when they got there. These were by appointment. They were still doing them. Um, they waited in their car. Then they drove up. Uh, a provider examined them in their car, took a history uh, while they were still in their car, and did appropriate uh, testing. So that was done to, uh, uh, in large part, well, to provide the access for, for evaluation and at the same time keep our regular office sites safe. Um, additionally, very early on, we had started verbal screening of everyone entering the office. Um, to, again, had they been, had they traveled internationally? Did they have fevers? Did they have symptoms? We still do that today. We have somebody at the front door of every one of our buildings who uh, screens individuals, and uh, the individual is screened actually when they're still in their car. So we, we instituted this uh, no wait rooming process where people with appointments um, let us know that they've arrived from their car. Um, and when the provider is ready to see them, uh, and after they're screened, verbally screened, they're given a code word, um, and then they um, come to the front of the building and they're escorted directly to the um, exam room or procedure room, depending on the circumstance. And, um, you know, I don't see us ever returning to a situation where we're going to have packed waiting rooms where people are going to wait with other patients for, you know, 15 minutes or a half an hour for their doctor's appointment. People will wait in their cars or perhaps in some cases they'll be waiting at home if they live close enough and they'll be contacted ahead of time to come in and be escorted directly in. Um, so we've, uh, we've obviously done things like, you know, enhancing sanitation. We've limited the number of people who can go on an elevator at any one time. We've increased the, uh, we've changed our HVAC systems to increase outside air. So things that people don't even know about, we want to exchange, increase air exchanges uh, throughout our buildings. Um, and of course, one of the most important things we've done is we stood up a telehealth program. We started telehealth at Crystal Run about five years ago. Um, and at that time, uh, it was virtually impossible to get people to use it. Um, you know, if we had a few people a week, it was a lot. Uh, so much so that it basically it just withered. We really were, were doing essentially none of it. Um, in March, we went from doing, you know, three telehealth visits a week to over 2,000 to over 2, a day. 2,000? Uh, over 2,000 a day. And literally, we did this in, you know, we... We started working, thinking about it again in February, that this was part of our planning process. How were we going to do it? We started contacting payers because, frankly, the payers historically don't pay for telehealth, the, the insurance companies. So we started looking into that and bugging them in February, telling them that this is going to become important. And obviously, the, the good news is that, um, you know, the state ultimately um, uh, you know, required uh, payers uh, to uh, create parity between in-person visits and telehealth visits. So that, of course, made things a lot, a lot easier. But we were thinking about that. We were exploring different platforms, looking at which platforms we thought were the most secure, how we were going to do this, created a check-in process and check-out process, both for telehealth and for in-person visits that doesn't require contact with a, you know, a human being in the office. Uh, again, all to minimize potential exposure um, and to you know and to encourage uh, social distancing. So um, a, a whole variety of things that that we've done. We've we've done a, a laboratory program where people. We've actually, in some cases, um, we're 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 moving away from this now. But for a while, we were doing some of our uh, for our most fragile patients. Uh, we were uh, doing outdoor phlebotomy. Um, that is drawing blood while people were still outside uh, if they were particularly at high risk. We moved phlebotomy closer to the entrance of our building so people who were just coming in uh, for blood work wouldn't have to, you know, go all through the building and wait, you know, to have their blood test done. So we've, we've done a whole variety of things and uh, we really feel that we've created a very safe environment for for patient care and you know for the most part uh, every one of these uh, innovations or changes will continue so the the no 
weight rooming process is something that we you know continue to work to improve upon um, and uh, really the telehealth we continue to work to improve upon and uh, I think you know we have learned some things that we can do I mean we moved many uh, like like uh, Linda mentioned uh, we've moved as many people as possible who don't need to be in the office you know off-site working from home etc and you know some element of that will continue uh, well into the future thanks Hal. Joan, does the hospital look the same as we come out of this, or what changes do you want to make? And specifically, does telemedicine at all play a role in the hospital? Absolutely. So the hospital, I don't believe, will ever go back to the way it was um, for many reasons. Um, I, I definitely agree what Hal had said as far as the social distancing. So even now, elective surgeries have started. But there are no visitors coming in with the patient. No one, they, they sit, stay in their car. They wait until the surgery is done. And I do believe that um, that will be lifted at some point, but it will be limited. And if you go into any of our waiting rooms in preparation for this, that there are maybe one third of the chairs because of the sh social distancing. Um, one entrance. Um, one entrance for elective surgery, one entrance for everybody else, employees, um, telemedicine, absolutely. We started telemedicine um, last year sometime with our stroke patients, and okay. that um, that has been very beneficial. And we have been able to, um, the, um, our neurologists have been able to diagnose quickly without coming into campus whether or not the patient is evolving as a stroke and then the appropriate intervention uh, prescribed and treated. We extended this a little bit more uh, during this COVID crisis. We had tele-ICU at night where we had a provider, um, one provider really looking over several hospitals, not just Montefiore St. Luke's Cornwall, but several hospitals and providing consultation. And we had um, cameras in each one of the rooms. Um, a silly thing that has been implemented, and it's not silly, it's very, um, we have robots in the room for those patients who are at um, risk for fall. So we utilize this in a little bit of a different capacity when um, all of a sudden our ICU became, our, our med medical surgical unit became an intensive care unit. We could utilize those robots to view the patients because it was not set up to be an ICU. So you really need to have eyes and ears when you were trying to care for the uh, the sickest of the sick. So I think telemedicine will definitely, um, our primary care physicians, most of their visits were no longer on site. They were telemedicine visits. Um, our primary care physicians that are employed by us and also our primary care physicians, such as um, Linda's staff and Hal's staff and Horizon staff, um, the majority of the physicians were seeing their patients telemedicine. Um, in the ED, you know, we're looking at implementing that a little bit um, in the future because I do think one of the one of the challenges going to be Jonathan is that when I spoke to my colleagues in EMS, people are afraid to come back to the hospital. They really they're concerned, and I truly understand that. Um, however, our job as leaders in this um, community. And I mean all business leaders and I mean all hospital leaders, there is a time to come into the emergency room. And it's not when you have an earache or that you have a bug bite, but if you're having chest pain or you're having signs and symptoms. There is really, we've seen too much death in the last 10 weeks. And some people dying at home that should not have died at home because of the fear. So you, at the age of 40, 50, 60, 70, I mean, there's no reason to have a stroke at home. There's no reason to die of a heart attack at home. So we have to deliver care differently and to make sure the community feels safe. And that's going to be separate entrances and to make sure that there is enough um, distancing between the patients. It's going to be a different world. I'm not, I'm not really confident it will come back to the old way, nor should it. Linda, you and I were speaking earlier about the, you know, the, while everyone is one of the areas that people are focused on, rightly so, telemedicine. But 
among your world, not everyone has access to telemedicine. Can you talk a little bit about how telemedicine might impact, you know, your world? Um, sure. So March 11th, everything changed for us. Um, we had been doing telemedicine for behavioral health, substance use disorders around Suboxone um, for quite a while. So our platforms were in place. We just had never deployed it because we're a primary care practice. Face-to-face -face is how you know doctors, nurse practitioners, dentists take care of their patients. So when that stopped and we ramped up um, the telemedicine, which became the method of choice, some patients that are in the inner city markets or um, any of them that are disenfranchised may not have um, internet availability or a computer at home, but what they had was a phone. So we not only did telemedicine, we did telephonic um, work with a patient. And so knowing our patients, having their medical record available to all the providers, you could, you know, quickly ascertain if that patient needed to be brought in. If the patient needed to come in, um, not unlike how Hal set up his world, we had outside tenting for patients to come in their car, have a telemedicine visit before they got there to determine if they had the right symptoms to get a COVID-19 test. So what if you don't have a car? Right. You don't drive up and go underneath the canopy and meet the staff there. So we set up a, essentially a COVID room. We took our giant uh, community room, moved beds and all the equipment into one space with one door that if a patient doesn't have a car and they needed to be seen because that was the only method that we could do, we could safely bring them into a space that was confined, that only respiratory patients who met the criteria for COVID-19 would be seen, and they could feel comfortable that the people seeing them were appropriately dressed with PPE and that they were in a safe condition. So um, you know, we've got to, we've had to be really kind of quick on our feet, not unlike Joan. Staff entrance, we never had one of those before. We used to come in at any door, so now there's a staff entrance. Um, there's one entrance if you still have um, any respiratory symptoms that you will come in and be immediately transferred into that room. Um, and telemedicine has been the way that we've been able to, to really manage our patients. I just, so a statistic, if you kind of look at um, how we've tested patients for the last eight weeks. So We've done 2,032 um, COVID-19 tests. Out of that, 992 were negative and 897 were positive. Out of the 897, only 37 of them were transferred to the hospital for advanced care because they were very, very ill. The great news is um, that we were able to manage them from home with telemedicine, care management, and twice a day check-ins. But I think the really important piece to understand out of all the patients that we tested, um, the total results uh, 596 out of that, that 897, 67% of them were African-American or Latinos um, that were positive for the disease. We all know that um, this is an equal opportunity infection However, in communities of color or communities where great disparity exists, there is a higher incidence of death and severe reactions to the virus than there is in the general population. It is a direct co connection to places that don't have access to quality health care. So I think we saw the, the numbers that we saw um, of being able to manage at home very limited number of deaths that we had. I think we were somewhere uh, under 10 out of everybody who we've managed who passed away is doing the basics that need to be done. We know that that this this disease affects the, the blood vessels, especially the small ones. And so people with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, respiratory illnesses, obesity, we know that those are all contributing factors. And where there is good infrastructure for patients who are marginally insured, not insured, where they can access care without the concern about how do I pay for that visit, 
those conditions are appropriately treated. And I think that by by having a health center in our big cities, big cities for us, Newburgh, Middletown, and Port Jervis, sure. uh, we've taken care of the folks that would normally have to rely on the hospital's emergency department. As Joan said, don't come in there with a bug bite. Don't come in, you know, for non-emergent region, reasons, but without a provider who does that, then that's where they would go. So the continuity of care um, that we have been able to do, I think, has made a big difference. Those communities that have limited access to that type of clinical support, the numbers are worse, which is what you saw kind of consistently in New York. High urban areas, low ability to be connected to a physician other than for emergency services, and an underlying disease that hadn't been treated. So, Linda, let me just stay with you for a second. So, before this um, pandemic occurred, there was a raging debate about healthcare in the United States. Has the pandemic, what do you think it might do? you know, with regard to insurance or will it have any impact at all, you know, with regard to how people view the provision of health care? Um, if I had the answer to that question, Jonathan, I would be running for president. Um, but what I can tell you is, is an, an organization like ours, a federally qualified health center, we are the great equalizer. So if you're looking at, at the expansion of Medicaid for all, that's us. That's what we've do. That's what we've done since 1967. So regardless of whether you have insurance, don't have insurance, um, you know, we we have the ability to see everyone, regardless of their situation, immigration status, um, employment status, gay, straight, uh, disabled, not. It doesn't make a difference. Everyone comes in, and that singular barrier to care, which is the biggest one. The financial barrier doesn't exist in our world. We're not a free clinic. That's absolutely, I don't want people to get the wrong impression. But what we are able to do because of our federal support is we can make this, this slide based on the federal poverty guidelines to be a non-issue for everyone. Look, I think that, that all Americans can think about the same thing. We either pay for health care at the time that the health care is needed. And if it is deprived of patients, People will still seek health care. They will seek it at the wrong time when they're very, very sick, when they're when it's very difficult to manage them, things that could have been taken care of that didn't get taken care of cost the United States far more in money and in lives. And so I don't know what the political debate will be. We all know that everybody's in the state's got no money. The federal government's going to have no money. They keep, you know, we keep doing stimulus packages that my grandchildren, probably their children and their mm -hmm. children's children are going to worry about. I'll be long gone. Um, you know, how, what is the sustainability of coming up with a plan that says for once the health care of everyone is as important as the health care for some? Hal, uh, you've thought about how to pay for health care for as long as I've known you. So has this changed at all what could I'd, happen? I'd make a, a couple of comments. Look, I, I don't have every answer. I don't pretend to have every answer. Uh, I do know a few things. One, <laughs> the Affordable Care Act, which I support, um, may have been the best we could have gotten at the time. But for the most part, did not change health care. Let's be clear. There's two different things we're talking about here, and they are conflated consistently. Health care delivery and health care financing. They are two very different things. Without financing, you don't get delivery. But with financing, you could still have a pretty poor delivery system. I say again, you know, I am totally, I agree that there are lessons learned and we all need to work together. I agree that the federal government, the state government, frankly, the world, you know, needs to work together on things like pandemics. But, you know, as some very smart people have said, you know, the uh, pathogens outnumber us. We have to outsmart them. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. Um, 
like I started to say before, PPE, ventilators, hospital beds, providers, nurses, all really important, and I'm thankful that they're here. But the real answer to addressing a pandemic is to stop it before it becomes so bad. The, and you could say, well, that's you know, hindsight. Yes, it's hindsight. But again, we prepare for warfare by dealing, pe teaching people how to deal with it. The time, yes, the, the president has said, you know, the Obama administration left us with really bad tests. Of course, you can't have a test for something that doesn't exist. Agree. You can't have a vaccination for something that doesn't exist. Agree. But you can have the, you know, creating testing, creating PCR tests, polymerase chain reaction testing, creating serologic tests, antibody tests. This is basic. This is microbiology 101. This doesn't require, this is not the cure to cancer. It's not, it's not the cure to anything. It's simply doing what we know how to do. It's grunt work. And there are laboratories in the world that actually spend time trying to figure out how to create vaccines more easily that are more effective and testing. The United States, I have this document here that I received on February 6th from HHS. It's an email. It said, HHS and the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response seeks abstract submissions for 2019 novel COVID virus diagnostic development. They sent this to me as an email, and I assume to most other physicians. You know, that's not how we, we don't start the space program by saying, hey, some smart scientists out there, would you like to put a man on the moon? No, you develop the infrastructure that makes it possible to successfully launch rockets and do landings. Same thing here. We, sh we should have learned, and now we must learn, that we could have teams of physicians. I mean, I know, you know people say, well, you know, Quest is doing a great job, LabCorp is doing a great job. The way this should have been handled is there should have been agencies in the federal government that were sufficiently well-funded to be prepared for a viral pandemic anywhere in the world and to immediately begin creating the necessary testing and vaccination. Once they had developed the blueprint, then that could have been shared at no cost with the commercial laboratories. We keep hearing that there's all these antibody tests that are not reliable. We hear that the Abbott test that was so touted is um, unreliable, false negatives in up to 40% of cases. We need to do better. Coming back to, you know, again, your question, I know what, what does this have to do with the healthcare system? This is all part of public health and the health delivery system. Just as I said before, having an interconnected uh, national database of health data would have allowed us to identify problems in this case. And frankly, you know, people have asked questions. Does, obviously, hydroxychloroquine, is that effective? Really doubt it. Um, does vitamin D help? Maybe. Does MMR, measles, mumps, rubaxa, uh, rubella vaccination, have any benefit against this virus? There's been some reports. Again, don't everybody decide they need to get all these things. What I'm saying is, if we had a truly 21st century healthcare delivery system, all we would have to do is do some data mining. We would be able to correlate vitamin D levels with the rate of susceptibility to infection, and we would have these answers. It doesn't require a new discovery. It requires using big data that actually exists and is used in other industries. Coming, you know, back, and it would also tell us for other problems, for whether it's, you know, um, you know, coronary artery disease or, or, you know, other issues, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, and that data would be available for analysis. So we could do a lot to improve our healthcare system just by understanding the data, uh, aggregating and, and um, analyzing the data that we already have. Getting back to this specific question, 
I'll ask the question, has the federal government done a fantastic job with this pandemic? If you believe it has, you might want to put it in charge of the greater health care system. If you think that it sucks, you might not. And the funny part is, the people who think that, you know, if you, if you go across strictly party lines, you know, Democrats tend to believe the federal government did a terrible job with the pandemic, yet might believe that federally controlled health care system is a great idea. Um, what do I think? I think universal health care is a right. I think every, no one should be denied health care in the United States of America, period. I think the federal government is incapable of running such a system at this time. And frankly, I would be very concerned about putting the health care delivery system solely in the hands of the federal government and, and even more so the financial system. I mean, think about this. Again, whether you like the current administration or you don't like the current administration, we got closest we've ever come to universal health care with the Affordable Care Act and the current administration would like to destroy it. Again, take whichever side you want. You, you believe that President Obama was right with the Affordable Care Act, but now there's an administration that wants to destroy it. Um, to me, we can't leave the financing of health care to the federal government until the majority of Americans think that this is a human at universal right, and they would be unwilling to support any candidate for any office who didn't support it. Hospitals are always struggling with the financial models that currently exist, and revenues, and patient care, and everything. Joan, how has this, is there anything that you've even had time to think about with regard to the, how the economics of a hospital will work going forward? Well, um, there's little I think more of, quite frankly, these days, because Jonathan, this has been an, an incredible impact. Um, like, like Cal and Linda, everybody who comes into the hospital, we need to treat, and we do treat. We cannot turn anyone away, nor would we, nor should we. That being said, the reimbursement, it doesn't cover the cost of care. So... When you look at every dollar I spend, if I put all my commercial in and my Medicare and my Medicaid, covers about 90 cents on a dollar. So you can do the math. You open up your doors and you know, roughly a $240 million um, operating budget. You, know, you, you open up your door on January 1st, and you're, you're north of $10 million already in the red. So yes, um, what Hal said is true. The delivery care and the, and the payment of care don't match. So it's the only service in the world. You go, you go into Lord & Taylor's, you buy a shirt, you pay for your shirt. You go to the restaurant, you buy a dinner, you pay for the dinner. You go to the hospital and you receive care and you pay for it. It gets paid for later. And maybe, maybe they decide that the patient is, is, isn't as sick as you state. So you go through the whole denials. One thing I will say, um, and um, kudos to our Department of Health and kudos to our governor and our elected officials. The elected officials are our are, are senator, our congressman, um, Steve Newhouse, the mayor in Newburgh, the supervisor of Cornwall. They've been outstandingly supportive. Um, I do believe stopping the regulations right now, it's in effect, I believe, until June 18th, no, no care provided in the hospital can be denied. That's, that's sort of nice. <laughs> that's sort of nice. But the economics of healthcare, the economics of trying to make it work in a vital access provider, where, um, and that's what I'm considered. I'm in the middle of, of, of Newburgh. I'm not in Scottsdale. Um, I have a fair amount of commercial pay payers, but I have a lot more Medicare, Medicaid, and um, self pay. So it's going to be a challenge. I constantly, Every three, four weeks, we're doing reprojections. I had a budget that was a fine budget that we put into the system in October for projections of 2020. And 
we ripped it up several times already. And every month we're reprojecting again. It will be a challenge. I want to give each of you a minute for either closing remarks or if you, you know, just a minute. So, and in it, would you like to include some comment to your employees? So, Linda? Sure. Um, first, I, I'd like to thank my colleagues um, that are here on the panel, uh, Dr. Teitelbaum and, and Joan Cusack McGurk. Uh, knowing that you're not in this alone is, is always very reassuring. And to, to specifically my staff, um, they left home, the safety of their home, to come in and don their PPE and do nasal swabs for COVID-19, treat patients, see, deliver babies, see the little guys two and three days post-birth back in the health center. They left the comfort and the security of their home to come and do the work that they do on behalf of our communities. I am humbled by what they've accomplished. They are remarkable. It's service above self. It's patient above all else. Um, as I watch them on our mobile health vans going in the community, when the community can't come to us, we go to them and do the same thing, don their PPE, put themselves at risk to ensure that our patients can be healthy and our communities can be safe. It is a remarkable thing to watch and I'm forever in their debt. Thanks, Linda. Hal? Uh, I think uh, I think Linda said it very well and uh, we, we too appreciate having, you know, great colleagues in our community um, and um, you know, in particular, uh, we've you know worked uh, we work with everyone, but we've worked particularly with uh, Joan and her team at uh, Montefiore St. Luke's, and uh, we're glad that we could uh, pitch in there and at four other hospitals uh, where our um, physicians and uh, advanced practice providers volunteer to help out. Um, and uh, you know, I too would you know thank. Uh, everyone at Crystal Run um, who believes, as I do, in the primacy of patient welfare, you know, altruism as it applies to um, to medicine. Again, Linda said it well, patient before self. And uh, that's what we believe in. Um, our, um, our All of our staff, uh, you know, demonstrated that at this difficult time and uh, for that for that we are very thankful. I think the true measure of any organization, frankly, and of all of our, of all our organizations uh, and of the people in them is not what we do when it's easy, but what we do when it's difficult. And uh, I think uh, uh, you know, Cornerstone and Montefiore St. Luke's and Crystal Run uh, will have a lot to be proud of. Thanks, Hal. Joan? Well, thank you, Jonathan, for hosting this today. It really, I, it's, it's really very beneficial even to talk about it with my colleagues and um, to echo both um, Hal and Linda's words. I, I'm appreciative of their camaraderie throughout this ordeal. And um, it wasn't only through this, it's been through past times too. Um, you know, to the frontline workers and not only just in Montefiore, St. Luke's, but throughout the nation. Um, being a nurse, being a nurse my whole life and watching this and watching it, 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 it in, one, in one way, it did remind me of 911 when you saw those brave people running to the building. Well, that's, that's, that's what they've done. And um, I, it could bring me to my knees telling you about it. It's just, um, you know, one of my nurses said, well, Joan, this is what we signed up for. No, no one signed up for this. This is above and beyond. And the physicians and the nurses, the dietitians, the environmental service workers, and then also to be surrounded by such a high level of mortality. And some were our employees. And um, there are no words, hero, courageous, not courageous without fear. There was fear, but they put that aside 
And they went in and they did what they had to do. And we're a better community because of them. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Joan. I'm just going to end with Winston Churchill. Never was so much owed by so many to so few. And I thank all three of you for your time today. Time is valuable right now. Linda, Hal, Joan, thank you so much. I'm Jonathan Drapkin. This was a healthcare panel provided by Hudson Valley Patent for Progress. Everyone be safe, be well, and most of all, remain positive. Thank you. Thank you.